So tonight we're going to hear from several individuals. Uh, we have Dwayne Morris here. He is the Assistant Director with Auxiliary Services, the Event Services Division. I'm sure many of you are familiar with what he does if you've been to a concert or been to an event on campus. Uh, Mr. Kitch Walker is here. He's the President of Ripple Marketing. Uh, and then we'll also hear from the College of Business. We have a, an assistant professor who will be joining us this evening uh, to talk to you a little bit about what's available in the program. Uh, and then Diane Donnelly is here to talk to you about the Academic Advising Center as well. So with that, I'm going to uh, invite Kitch and Dwayne up and they will uh, tell you a little bit about themselves and what they, uh, what they do. So welcome. Whoever would like to begin, I will turn it over to you. Go ahead. Uh, welcome. My name is uh, Dwayne Morris, as Aaron said. Uh, I'm the Assistant Director of uh, Auxiliary Services, and I'm responsible for a division called the Event Services Division, which includes the field house, the stadium, uh, Shannon Union Building, conference services, ticketing, concessions, things that are you know, in conjunction with facility management or running events. Um, I guess the first thing, I, I found it interesting in the slide that Aaron was just showing, yeah, I have a degree in public relations and I'd never seen anything like that slide, that kind of four step, but I'll talk about two of them, um, on how I ended up with my degree. Number one was a self-assessment. What did I like to do? I liked to write, I liked to speak, I hated anything that ended in the ologies, and I was bad at math. So uh, I decided, and I also liked professional sports, and at that point, um, which ties into the second thing, how do I get there? Uh, sports marketing was just coming you know, into its own at that point, entertainment. Um, you know, it was no longer acceptable just to throw the ball out in the field and let the athletes run out and hope people showed up. They were actually figuring out how to market themselves, create game promotions, those types of things. That's what I wanted to be involved in in professional sports. So I looked at it and said, with well, a PR marketing degree, that'll get me there because I can write and I can talk and all those things. So that's why I ended up with a degree in uh, public relations from uh, a little school in Ellensburg, Washington called Central Washington University. Not so little anymore, I guess. Um, my background and my jobs, um, which the first thing I would say is one of the questions, we've, we've been given a list to talk about and then Aaron gave us five minutes, now we've been get, given seven. So if I'm talking fast, it's because we've got a lot to cover. Um, but one of the things is how you obtain your position. Everything for me, and I'm 44 now, I graduated in 87, a long time ago, um, everything goes back to a one single internship that I did. Everything I've ever done. I've gotten, I think, one job in my entire career because I interviewed for it. The rest of the jobs I've gotten because my phone has, has rang, I picked it up, or I got a call. It was, it was about relationships is my point. And it all came back to one internship. So while you may think, well, that career fair is not that important, that internship, that one internship for me has determined the direction of my life. It's why I'm sitting here today. So uh, don't underemphasize that. Um, my background is uh, I interned at an ad agency um, who had as an account at Central Washington State Fair. Uh, I worked the summer there, got involved with events. They were doing rodeos, monster trucks, uh, some concerts, those types of things. Went back, finished my degree, interned with the Seattle Sonics for three weeks. It was supposed to be for the rest of the season, but I was working for my brother and my sister's, excuse me, my girlfriend's mm -hmm. brother-in-law, who ended up being a complete jackass. Um, I lasted three weeks. I called my father. It was an unpaid internship, by the way. The only thing I got was a free pair of shoes. There were two sizes too big, but I called my father and I said, I don't know what to do. And he said, well, let me ask you a question. Are you making any money? And I said, no, I'm broke. I and mean, we're living on lawn chairs and, and no one remembers Xavier McDaniel. He was a guy, he was a power forward for the Sonics and they had a bumper stickers we give out at Sonics games and it said, X-Man eats here. And you'd peel off the back and you could get a Whopper for 50 cents. That's how we were eat, living, was we were living off 50 cent Whoppers. So I said, no, I'm not making any money. He said, are you learning anything? I said, no, I get yelled at the entire day. This guy's a complete jerk. And he said, are you having any fun? I said, I think I just answered that. And he said, well, what are you doing? And you know, my, I'm the first kid to go to college in my entire family. So my dad is pretty wise, despite the fact that he never made it through high school. So I uh, got out, kind of gave up on my dream, went back to work at the fair, and then I got a call to work uh, as be the GM of the Helena Brewers in the minor league uh, system for the Milwaukee Brewers in the Pioneer League for two years. Did that for two years, went back to Yakima. In the meantime, they'd opened up an 8,000-seat arena. Didn't 
interview, got a call, asked if I was willing to come back. I went back, ran the arena for four years, was there, phone rang one day, a company called Feld Entertainment, which is Ringling Brothers, Barnum & Bailey, Disney on Ice. Now they have all the Supercross, they have all the Monster Jam stuff. Uh, they used to have Siegfried and Roy, you know what happened to that. Um, and I got a call to go back to work for them in their corporate office. I was the director of North American Tours for four years. We handled uh, all the shows in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. We'd route the shows, negotiate the terms, about 150 to 175 million dollars of the business a year, and then we would get the contracts done. Um, and then in '98, I was traveling about 40 percent of the time. My wife, who's a native, I met when I lived in Helena. We basically said, "Where do we want to live?" So we ended up in Bozeman, Montana. So uh, that was 11 years ago, and. Uh, so I'm, I'm racing through here because there's some things I wanted to make sure. What's the most important lesson I've learned over the course of my career? Number one, always get the merchandise money on the night of the show. The merchandise guy that tells you he'll send you the money the next day is, is lying to you and he's going to screw you. So always get your money up front. <laughs> Number two, the guy that ran the ad, ad agency in Yakima who passed away about eight months ago, bless his soul, who gave me, he's the one that hired me for my internship. Bob Phillips told me one day when I got in an argument with the publisher of the newspaper, he said, don't ever get in a pissing contest with a guy who buys his ink by the barrels and his paper by the rolls. So that's the best advice that I would give you there. Uh, what's important to consider uh, when beginning in the field? It, it's a, it is actual experience, and, and I think Aaron was talking about that. You've got to differentiate yourself somehow. And the people that we end up hiring at the field house, or that I recommend, are people that have worked for folks. The first person we hired to fill an event coordinator position was a young lady named Stephanie Hudson. Stephanie was a Bozeman High graduate. Graduate. Her mom teaches here on campus. No, she teaches works here on campus. She went to Gonzaga. She interned at Spokane Arena. She got done. I got a call from my buddy who runs Spokane Arena and said, "Hey, we got this young lady. She wants to come back to Bozeman." That's how we end up hiring Stephanie Hudson. So, but she got experience at Spokane Arena through an internship, um, and that's what led to that. Uh, how am I doing? Um, as an employer, why do you hire students with a blank degree? Um, you know, I, I know this. We're all here for marketing. I, I don't really care so much as um, you have a degree and you have some experience. So I don't care if you're a biology major, but you've done an internship at Key Arena in Seattle. That's what interests me. Um, the other thing is, is that. Uh, what I'm looking for are some of the things, frankly, that your parents hopefully taught you. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a pretty candid person. I'm hoping they taught you some common sense. I'm hoping they gave you some work ethic, uh, that they taught you right from wrong. Those are the things that I can work with. I can't teach you character, and I'm not here to teach you character. Um, so when you come out, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone who can be a part of our team and who will step in uh, and will treat you like a veteran. But you've got to be a part of the team. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Um, and I'm also looking for someone that can build relationships, which I think is one of the biggest things that people struggle with these days. Is they don't have that skill and that ability to be able to build that relationship. Two minutes. Okay. Any words of wisdom? Um, don't rush. Uh, everyone seems in a huge hurry, and maybe some of it is because a lot of you are, gradu are graduating with a lot of debt and you want to get out and pay that off. But don't get in this huge hurry. I mean, take your time. Enjoy yourself. Um, enjoy being young. Um, I, I enjoyed that, um, and I wouldn't redo my life at all. And I, the sec ties into the second thing, and that is don't be afraid to take a risk. Um, you know, when I got a job offered an opportunity to go to Helena, I just met this great gal. We were dating. You know, I, and I'm going to, this is going to sound kind of crass. I don't mean it, but love doesn't always last. Boy, I'm sure glad I took that job in Helena. I mean, but the point of it is, is that, you, you know, evaluate what you want to do. And you're only going to go through that period once. So don't be afraid to take that job offer that, you know, I'm not really sure about this. Maybe do it. What's a year and a half? Go do it. Maybe you'll find something that's totally different. So don't be afraid to take that risk and, you know, get the blinders off. Enjoy yourself. Be 20 something. And uh, and, and have fun. The last thing I would tell you, and I think I'm right on time, my biggest frustration with some of the younger folks that we hire or younger folks that I help in the industry is they have no patience. They want to go from being an event coordinator, which if you come into our business, that's where you come in pretty much at the bottom. They want to go from being an event coordinator to being a building manager or an arena manager in three years. It doesn't happen, okay? I'm a fluke. I was uh, totally, I was an anomaly, but have some patience. You've got to serve and put in your time. Um, but it seems like I get so frustrated, frustrated with them because a year and a half they're like, well, I'm bored. I don't want something more. So you've been there a year and a half. Put your time in. Because next thing you know, your resume is going to be look, look like a job hopper. No one's going to hire you because you don't stay anywhere. So that'd be the one thing I would offer in terms of advice, and I'll turn it over to Kitch. You're going to find two things in common with 
public relations marketing folk because we can talk fast. <laughs> I think that's why we got put on the panel. We get five minutes, we got to extend to seven, and we can fill it. So it had nothing to do with qualifications. <laughs> no, no. We had to actually do a test where test we were how many phone. words we could speak per yep. minute. Yep. Skip the typing right on the audio. Yep. So uh, I don't tend to sit still very well, so I think it's partially ADD for us folks, right? I've had knee surgery, so I don't have any choice. <laughs> no choice. I'm sitting here. Oh, empathy. I'll try to hold still a little bit. Uh, my name is Kitch Walker, uh, born and raised in Great Falls, Montana. Came to Montana State University in 1992. Uh, I spent six years here, went through triple options, uh, finished in a Bachelor of Science in Business in both marketing and management options. Also finished in Bachelor of Science in biz, uh, Biology under the Fish and Wildlife Management side. Uh, during that time I also worked full time, so I spent three years managing for Walmart in the horticulture, lawn and garden seasonal departments, uh, running things such as uh, uh, buying Christmas decorations all the way over to playing with plants in the greenhouses, uh, partly because of the biology side, oddly enough. Uh, also during that time I spent two years uh, mentoring under uh, Dr. Norm Milliken, Montana State University professor, 30 year marketing professor, who I founded our firm with in 1998 called Ripple Marketing out of the basement of my uh, 80 square foot bedroom in our fourplex apartment. Uh, which is quite the experience because if there's two full-time, myself, a co-graduate, Anita Dewald, and Dr. Norm Milken, who was a part-timer because the room wasn't big enough for three full-time people. So we shared that space, fortunately. In that context, uh, when we were going through school, and, and I'll reaffirm, on the internship side, what you do in college beyond your degree ends up, tends to end up being what you do when you leave. When I was in the biology side, most of the fish and wildlife management people were either working with uh, fish, wildlife, and parks, etc., on their way to an MBA or doing things in construction like laying carpet. And where do you think they ended up working when they got out? In that competitive environment, especially in that degree program, especially, was a really a niche MBA, PhD type of program. And people tend to set their own course during the course of learning their education. They also set their own course in the things they're doing to make a living. And we make critical choices each and every year. So on the internship side, you know, I had the opportunity to work full time. I skipped internships and went straight into the uh, work overnight shifts at Walmart, setting up entire sections of the store, for example, till 8 a.m. in the morning, go to class at 9, be done at 4, sleep three hours, go back to work. You know, and on top of that, I also attended bar. I also worked in Roski Hall at the front desk in the night shift. I also spent time doing market research as a market research assistant with Dr. Norm, excuse me, Norm Milliken, working on projects that I worked on with clients well, uh, well into my time now, almost uh, 11 years in May, going on 12 years after that, of course. Uh, and I'll give you an example in that experience that uh, really struck me. Norm said it's the two, the guy and the gal, as he refers to Anita and I at the time, said there's two reasons I went into business with those two people. First is when they came to me and said, hey, we want to sit down and talk to you about something we'd like to do. He thought, I thought they're going to ask my advice on how to start a business. And their words were, we'd like you to join us. And at that time, you can't be too stupid in thinking two young college graduates and a guy with a lot of gray hair. Who do you think knows everybody and knew everything about marketing and had all the connections? And when he spoke, people listened. When we spoke, people asked where the restroom was. You know, there's, there's some time that you have to put into the experience in education, the, the mentorship, the things you were accomplishing under that tutorship, and later on into partnership, uh, where Norm struck some of the channels we got to work in. And later on, you start to grow in your own shoes. And, you know, I did seminars with Norm, the guy running the IT PowerPoint projector because he was a transparent overhead slide guy. And so you'd run the PowerPoint. And then eventually we were doing splitting the seminars half and half. And eventually I got to actually speak the whole time. Norm's only advice was, I wish you'd slow down when you talk. <laughs> so in those segues, you know, I had a chance to sit in Bentonville, Arkansas and negotiate with 300 in, uh, vendors for, on a district basis for lawn and garden and horticulture, set up stores. I also learned what I didn't like in that job, but about major corporate and retail uh, in a room full of people like this where they go, I'm going to tell you the price, we won't talk about it, but you're going to give me this price in front of all your peers and all the people there to buy. Uh, there was a sense of uh, uh, lack of value in that sense of system for me. You know, over the years as Ripple Marketing, we've had a chance to work all across the great state of Montana, but I've also worked in, in other industries in our profession as market research, strategic planning, advertising, graphic design, e-commerce, etc. Uh, with with uh, that experience in Ripple, uh, six years ago we merged in a second firm called Palmquist Creative, a uh, nationally recognized graphic design and strategic image management firm, the Palmquist or MSU graduates as well. Uh, two and a half years ago, I started a second company called Flat Earth Imports, importing Italian household durable goods into the States from Italy. 
uh, from Central Italy where we started consulting two and a half year, years ago with manufacturers as Ripple Marketing. So in that evolution, while we started out in a firm that worked on lots of companies, when I graduated, the thing I, when we graduated in 98, there was a number of options. Target, Boeing, Walmart, Arthur Anderson, which was a good choice not to have at this point, right? A number of other companies, but it all meant that you had to leave Montana. So I was already eating Top Ramen. <laughs> so we thought, why not start a company? You know, you take the entrepreneurial approach and you're going to live on Top Ramen or you get a job. So we had that opportunity to do some things on our own and craft and build relationships and do projects that in a single job I would have never have gotten to do at any one job ever. I've worked on the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association in New York, which is a trade association for Merrill Lynch's, et cetera. Not in good shape at the moment, by the way. Uh, part of some of my dress. Uh, but also on things like Duckworth and Wellcraft boats. Uh, we've had a chance to work on things like Dana Design backpacks, skis. Uh, we've worked on Montana Furniture Industries, First Security Bank and Bozeman. Uh, we've done stuff at the American Bankers Association level at the Montana Bankers Association. We've done things in the in manufactured goods uh, healthcare, nonprofits, economic development, etc. So it's like working on a ton of different jobs in one job. And each week I might be working on anywhere from two to 20 different projects and working with anywhere from 17 to 25 professional level individuals, including staff we have in Italy on the team out of Umbria and Perugia and Gubbio and up in Milan. I've spoken at seminars from here to New York to Milan, which I never thought I would do as a Montana kid, to be honest. Never thought I'd be in Italy two and a half years ago and have the chance to go over there and go, what well, other words do you know besides ciao? And does that mean hello or goodbye? <laughs> and to have a chance to start learning another language, another business environment, another culture, uh, and how marketing works and is understood in that environment, and how they were desiring to get to US markets, and how we crafted those solutions, and how we took Ripple and evolved it into a second company in this flat earth imports context. Now, in that, given that scenario, I tend to look for people like me, <laughs> people that went to MSU and or other great schools and built something beyond their degrees. I uh, tend to look for people who did something that added value to the resume. Internship, the Greek system, the MSU Leadership Institute, a marketing club, etc. The more you have beyond the class, the better you are. As anybody can get a degree. I'm telling you right now, I saw people who could skate through and get a degree. I'm telling you, I wouldn't hire those people. And I wouldn't want to work with those people. So I'd look at that and say, what have I done to add value beyond my degree? I think marketing is a phenomenal program. When I was here, I thought if I'm going to be here for four years, I might as well stay six and get three. <laughs> and I might as well work full time while I'm at it. And I got to tell you, I have no regrets in that sense. I have no regrets starting the firm. The only regret I have is when, as an entrepreneur, you live and die by the economy. Uh, so, but you also control most of your own hope. So you don't get laid off, you lay yourself off. <laughs> But you're usually the first to go, by the way. Because <laughs> you have no heart in letting anybody else go. Uh, and those are options of last resort. But we've seen the highs and the lows and the bubbles of the dot-coms, and we've seen the lows of the more traumatic September, middle of September, Lehman Brothers on. And I can tell you the peak of that. We call it the flock of birds. On July 28th, we launched the wholesale side of Flat Earth Imports, which sells products, tying products to independent retailers all over the US, as well as trade professionals. Six weeks later, in the same week we were doing a private equity offering for private investors to complement that project, it was the same week as Lehman Brothers. I've never seen so much oxygen leave the room ever. Along with it, every dollar and cent in the in a initial offering, or so much wealth dissipate in a single heartbeat. So it's quite interesting to be sitting here from September to now going, flock of birds. And you know why I call flock of birds? You remember the airplane that came off the ground and ran into a flock of birds and ended up in the Hudson? I feel like I'm sitting in the Hudson some days. As our plane comes off the ground July 28th, and you're going, woohoo! And hit the flock of birds, go, we're going to die! <laughs> and you land in the river. And you go, at least everybody's out in the wing going, so now what? Somebody better hold on until we can get the plane out of the river, put the engines back on the plane, and wait for the flock of birds to pass. Because people talk about entrepreneurship. It's phenomenal, but you don't control everything. So if people ask me how it's going, I say flock of birds. <laughs> So there's some perspective, both in the entrepreneurship side, you know, we've had great, great opportunities here at the campus. I've sat on the College of Business Advisory Board, I've sat on the MSU Libraries Board, I currently chair the MSU Leadership Institute Board. Uh, you notice a pattern during college and after college? And I look for the same patterns that you form in college, I expect you to form after college. If you're great, 
life-aspiring learner while you're here. I expect you to come into our firm and our environment, come in as you are, and continually add value to yourself beyond what you're there to get paid to do. So there's some examples. I'm sure we'll both be glad to take questions. Yes, turn it over to you. What questions do you have of our panelists? This is when we find out if you really just came for the pizza. I came for the pizza. <laughs> 50 cent burgers. <laughs> what questions? There's no bad or good question, believe me. What do you want to know? Um, What's your name? My name is Jenny Van Meken, um, and I'm in marketing. And I have minors in psychology and entrepreneurship and small business management. And I'm really trying to decide if I want to go down um, owning my own business route, or if I want to go out and make a lot of money working for big corporate firms. But with the way that the economy is, I'm a little concerned if I even want to get involved in the corporate world at all. But there's a lot of like personal risk in entrepreneurship. Do you think that there's less risk going in the corporate route? Uh, I think there's equal risk, but it's not about the job or the risk, it's about who you are. I chose the entrepreneurship side because of the things I thought were important to me with the job diversity. Uh, I call it hope. While I work more hours than I ever thought any human being should ever work in their job if I was getting paid by the hour, I work more, job, more hours in this job than I would have in a, another job being paid as an employee. But I have hope because any day I can go, I could go the ski hill today if I wanted to. But I tell you, as an entrepreneur, if you choose to stay at work and do that and still go to the hill, you're more likely to be an entrepreneur than an employee. If you choose to go to the ski hill, you're more likely to be a weekend, eight to five. I'll work for somebody else, but my time's my time. As an entrepreneur, you tend not to have a lot of my time because your my time is your play time, which turns out to be work. So I think you gotta choose, not for risk, but for personal, uh, and I say it in the sense of personal risk and personal gain. I don't get paid the most. <laughs> I've turned down jobs that pay way more and I've wondered if I should have went the other route some days. My backup job, my backup plan, plan as an entrepreneur was to get a job. <laughs> if I suck at this, I'll get a job. Now in this economy, <laughs> not as good an option B, because then you go, I may have to stay an entrepreneur, I'll never get a job. <laughs> but you have to choose, and you choose when it's appropriate for you. And I think entrepreneurship's about where you have passion, where if passion meets the ability to make money, then it's a job that is an entrepreneur. If you can't make money at it, then it's a hobby. And you should get a job, my opinion. You know, I think it is a personal choice. I mean, I can, I've always considered myself a, a risk taker. I, you know, was not afraid to jump in a car and throw what I owned and move from Washington State over to Helena, Montana as a 23-year-old, not knowing a doggone thing about running a minor league baseball team. I'm willing to take that risk. But I've never, you know, I've never been comfortable doing it. And I admire what Kitch is talking about. Is right out of the shoot, basically, you know, starting something in an apartment and, and living the dream. And every day, I mean, just that takes guts. And I, that's never interested me. I, and so I was able to take risk, but I was able to take risk on other people's dollars. The, the best thing I would tell you was the, and it's another lesson. Uh, my father told me, we were, I can remember the day very clearly, we were loading up our stuff to move, take it down to the storage place to get ready to ship to Washington, D.C., where, we where I was working for Ringling. And uh, we were in his beat old pickup, we were driving down the gravel road, and he said, don't go back there and get yourself in a position where you can't walk away. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, you know, I worked at that lumber mill for 29 years and I hated every day of it. And I said, why'd you stay? And he said, I had you two kids. I'm like, I, I, I don't get that. That's a generational thing, by the way. You know, uh, for you guys that with your grandparents, they stayed in their jobs for 30 years. I didn't understand that. I understood it about five years later when Angie and I got tired of travel and we literally sat down and said, where are we gonna live? We were able to take about a 70% pay cut to move back here because we could walk away. We drove the same cars back that we drove out there. The only thing we had was the house. Unfortunately, we sold it for more than we bought it for. But that's the biggest thing I would tell you is that when you're young, don't go out and, you know, and get yourself tied down to a lifestyle that dictates a certain income. Because you know, 
to me, I don't think that's a, a good thing. I have a, I have a, one of my best friends runs an 18,000 seat NBA arena in the Midwest. He runs a Target Center, and his wife uh, was a huge <laughs> VP for Target Corp. But then it became all the different variations they've gone through. She was making like three hundred thirty thousand dollars a year. He's making you know one hundred sixty. She's flying on the corporate jet. They got a beautiful cabin up. They got two beautiful boys going to a private school. At Twenty grand a year per kid. You know, a year and a half ago they got divorced. So you talk about a real gut check. And again, what's really important in your life? And I think for him it was. He, they got to the point to where all of a sudden they woke up and he was like, "What? What am I doing here?" He got himself in a position where the walking away got pretty expensive at that point. So that's the best advice I'd give you. Whether you go down the and the private side or an employment side. Go ahead. What's your name? My name is Sherry Green, and uh, I wanted to know maybe your insights on, say, if a firm isn't advertising for work, how what's the best way to go about putting your resume in and asking for a job? Is it like is it very likely to be too stressful? On the advertising side. Like basically any marketing job, like a mm -hmm. sales position or advertising, or just like I just I'm just looking at my feet, like anything right now, just get experience and figure out what I want to do. Cause I don't I don't even know. Right. Right now, at this point, so yeah, something along those lines. I think I'm confident we both address that. Uh, two things from the agency side, and especially in Montana, agencies are fairly small, uh -huh. and so if there's an internship, uh, there's usually one. Uh, we tend to usually have a graphic design intern, usually fall, spring as well. And we're handpicking the hand of the, uh, the crop, uh, the pick of the crop as it were, from the university professors up here. And the School of Art had for a long time and still does really strong relationships with our firm and uh, my partner sits on the School of, uh, of Art Advisory Board. If you want conduits to get jobs in the internship side, I'd start with the people who get called. The career services, and you know, I know the Bracken Center, some of those things are tremendously improved. I just sat there a few days ago going, we talked about internships and formally setting that program up here for years. What's the status? And they've taken great strides into finding internships. Outside of internships, and you get into Maine, you haven't done anything, it's going to be much harder to get your foot in the door. Cold calling a firm's fine, but I've got to tell you, there's a lot of applicants that come in with a lot more experience. And the experience doesn't have to be at a uh, marketing firm. It could be a platform opportunity. MSU Leadership Institute, you run the events on campus, you bring in speakers, you put posters up, you're doing marketing-related activities and meeting people on the advisory board, sitting with people that you bring in for speakers. There's other things that get you to the ideal job. You just got to plan a little ahead to do those things. I was just going to say, I think the biggest thing is, is think three steps ahead. And and I hate to say it, but it's that old saying of it's not what you know sometimes, it's who you know. And and that's, the, I, when kids start talking, I wrote out, who do you know? I mean, sit down and look at it and go, who, do, it's like that, you ever heard that uh, game, Seven Degrees of Kevin Bacon? <laughs> Again, generational thing, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally Kevin blank Bacon. look, exactly. <laughs> Who's Kevin Bacon? There's this game out there that you play that you can connect Kevin Bacon, the actor, to any actor within seven moves. So you go, okay, uh, Clint Eastwood. And within seven moves, you can go, Clint Eastwood is in a movie with this person. It, it's, that's, to me, how you build that network. And so there's someone you know. And if you don't, get to know them. Yeah, you're right. I mean, if, if you want to help marketing shows, we're, I'm looking for someone to put up posters, help us with street team stuff. Because again, I, you know, mar talk about marketing. I don't know how to market shows to you guys anymore. Most of you guys don't read the newspaper, so news print doesn't do us any good. How do I market? I need someone to come and help me. But I'll tell you something. There's five people, students, who walk in my door a year on average, okay? And they all come in and they all have a great idea. We want to do a concert. My buddy and I, no clue about how it works, but I'm always nice. I spend the time. But now I've got a new thing. I'm not spending a lot of time anymore. I'm basically saying, I tell you what, here's what I would do. If you go do this and you, and you, get, you do your homework and you come back, I'll help you. They never come back. So I don't want, I'm not going to help them because they're not, they're flaking. So develop it and stick with it. You know, and again, it's that character issue. If you're going to come in and you're going to tell me you want to help, then be there when I need you, and I'll be there when you need me. But that's how you do it. I'll give you a, it doesn't just start in college, by the way. I just literally set up a coffee meeting with a gentleman who's a student here in MSU in the marketing program. After three calls from Gordon at the Bozeman High School, who Gordon knows his Gordon yeah. yeah. spoke to his class? Yeah, he just called me out of the blue. It's a kitchen. I've met him in passing somewhere else in events like this, and he goes, I've got somebody you have to meet. 
if you have an internship opportunity at your firm or knowing you, you know people, you have to sit down with He called three times. He goes, I know you've been busy, but I'm calling you until I get a hold of you. <laughs> and, and he said, look, I'm advocating, I'm stumping for uh, the Plouffe family. I know them well. I know Jared, he's done this and this and this. He'd be an exceptional intern. Uh, I want to place him somewhere. And I've got to tell you, I haven't had a call from Gordon on any other student ever. So do I think highly of his recommendation? I'll sit down and try to figure that kid out. You bet. Whether I have a home or not. I don't care if I have to call the or I gotta call some other people. If there's somebody that you've met, you've worked hard for in high school, in your retail crappy job, serving tables, washing floors. One of those famous sayings, when I worked for the store manager at Walmart, he said, and by the way, do you know what role I started in at Walmart? Cart pusher. The guy goes out to the parking lot and pushes the damn carts into the building before they had machines. <laughs> Which I thought was glorious. I hated the job so much I renamed it. I called it CRT, Customer Response Team, because they called those people to come up and help take out packages and crap. I thought, this is great, I'm going to rename it so it doesn't sound like such a bad job. And so then, you know, I'm all high in this customer response team, and so somebody says, is that cart retrieval technician? <laughs> now Walmart uses CRT all over the place. I don't know how it got so viral or who picked it up or people just kept avoiding it like me. But the store manager said to me, Kitch, and he had this great theory, and so did a number of people before me. Do a phenomenal job, and the crappy job you have now, it'll get you the next job. I went up six positions from that job to department manager. I skipped everything else. After doing that job phenomenally well, renamed it, did this or that. I mean, I took on whatever the store had to offer for the first three months and skipped six positions. I was the last guy hired, by the way. My resume was so far back. And then uh, seven years later, I hired the HR gal that hired me to work in our office which is kind of interesting, I think it was a turn of fate, but do a phenomenal job in the thing you're doing now. Well, there's volunteering at the school with the people you're working with, and I gotta tell you, if you do a phenomenal job, they'll be sitting next to somebody else you need to meet, or who do you know that I could talk to about? I can't tell you there's any better advice, because through the relationships and the proof that you can do something besides know people. Thanks. What else? Do that. What other questions? Uh, my name is Brian, I'm also in marketing, and I really am getting into international business. So you mentioned learning the language in Italy. What else did you learn there? What else did you learn? <laughs> <laughs> Have you done some international stuff as well? You played? Considered Mexico. I had Mexico City. But. Mexico City? And then it's all international when you get there. Well, yeah. we'll both have, uh, I'm sure, cultural stories. We speak of the Montana World Trade Center has this come in and talk about cultural marketing. What's like there, what's like here, and the differences and nuances of doing business. The Italians are very much uh, Montana on steroids, in this sense. Family is family. Who you know counts more than what you know. Mm -hmm. Who gets the jobs in Italy? Sons and daughters, friends and relatives. Uh, part of it's also why not everything runs real smooth in Italy. Uh, I know most of the families come back with major degrees and still work for the family in a job they hate. Uh, when the family calls and they say, you need to come home and help pay the bills, you go home and help pay the bills, period. It's interesting working in that extreme of a family business environment. There's three price levels in Italy. What do you think the first price level is for all of us? There's a tourist price level. Then there's my friend sent you over, so your referral price level. And then there's family, which is usually generally free. The second price level is fairly expensive, and the tourists are paying most of it. <laughs> and so there's a number of nuances that we talk about in the sense of how people communicate. Uh, everything in an email starts with dear. There is no short kitsch comma. There's deer or you offend people. I got an email back. You don't have to talk so loudly through your email to me. What do you mean? You didn't even make a salutation. All right, dear everybody. <laughs> I didn't know email was so offensive. I mean, e-commerce in Italy, Italy's the last adopting e-commerce environment. They do not, and they'll weather the storm better because of it. They don't pay things with credit card. It's cash in hand, and most of them don't have checkbooks. Mostly cash in hand, mostly to avoid taxes, but Cash in hand. <laughs> so when they buy something, they have the money. You know, so there's a whole bunch of things that are culturally, both in the communication side, how you travel Italy. Even the Italians have uh, navigational devices because it's a tremendously complex country to get around. Even, uh, even though they're resident Italians, they still have navigation to get you to the countryside, which I think is interesting. Uh, they don't drive the speed limit very often, even though there's a lot of people that lose their license on the third time around. Uh, so there's a ton of stuff. 
if you haven't had the chance to leave the country, which when I was here, I did not. Now there's you know, programs in, and we're working with the College of Business, in fact, to put students in Italy. Uh, we're talking to Bruce Raymond, et cetera, to try to create this bridge to Italy through our connections, the School of Arts connections. But if you haven't traveled international, then you're missing out. I missed out. And when I got to Italy, I started a whole other company because of it. I haven't made it to any other European country yet. Started a company. Just think when I hit one more. Could be a whole flourish of enterprises. I haven't figured it out yet, but it was overwhelmingly uh, beneficial to think in that sense, to have new experiences, to meet new people. Uh, for me, the international side takes marketing up about nth, you know, about ten nth degree. So, if you haven't had a chance to get there, get there. The company I worked for filled uh, filled out a. Again, a North American division, which I was the director of, and then we had a uh, uh, international. And the two departments just mirrored each other, but they handled everything international. And there's some great opportunities for companies like that because they do every all across the globe, everywhere. The ice shows, and and uh, they're doing ice shows in the middle of a dirt pasture. They're putting up a tent and they're building tanks, and it's just amazing stuff. But there's a great opportunity to do that. We had Mexico City. I found Mexico City it drove me absolutely bonkers. Um, you know. It, the safety issue was a big thing. You know, we would go to a meeting and we'd be met by the security outside the building. We'd go to dinner. They'd take us to. I mean, security was just kind of. I mean, again, I'm a small town kid. It was a real different experience. Um, it, nothing is black and white. It's a very different, frustrating. Who you pay, who you know. You want this permit, and you better be willing to pay. We're bringing elephants, tigers. Mm -hmm. Couldn't bring the didn't take the horses in. Left them in Laredo, but. Animals, and which is a whole different issue, and so you got permitting. It's just, it's very frustrating. Um, I don't speak the language. I wish that I would have. I wish I would have paid attention a little more. And not got that D in Spanish in high school. Um, you know, our, our partner got carjacked on the way home from dinner from us. Got his car stolen. You know, basically got almost got killed. Uh, and th at that point, you go. You know, I think I'm, I'm welcome of welcoming of the security that you guys are providing. Um, you know, it's. Uh, I think it's a great experience. I, I wouldn't trade it, uh, but I was always glad to get home. <laughs> so. Other questions? It's time for one more. This is your chance. You See the marketing crazy guys talk. Huh? Okay, yeah. um, What's your name? I'm Tyler Nolan. Tyler? I'm um, currently in marketing right now, but I'm kind of wavering in between a couple of things. You keep mentioning the art school. Um, what kind of connections does business have with art exactly? Because it seems like you keep running them together a little bit. Beats me. I didn't. Here's here's. He uh, was talking about the art school. Huh? Yeah. The, <laughs> you're, you're up, Kitch. My business partner sits on the School of Art Advisory Board. I've sat on the College of Business uh, Advisory Board, and we were big advocates of of. That college doesn't take classes in the College of Business. The College of Business doesn't take classes in the School of Art. Which if you're in marketing and advertising, there's a creative process and then there's the more analytical marketing, strategy, research, etc. side. And you'd be surprised at how many great discussions go on between those two sides of the brain, the right side and the left side of the brain in the creative process uh, and the strategy development. Uh, we're big advocates for integrating more of the classroom uh, between, especially like School of Art, School of Art, graphic design students for internships in our office had to have and be taking marketing. Uh, we're big fans of school art students who have some creative or at least an appreciation for what other the creative process or at least some of the introductory art school stuff they should also think about being value add in that sense. If you look on the resume there's not many people that carry that over from marketing over. Uh, it's funny the graphic design folks if they never carried over they never learned how to write a resume or how to run an accounting system if they're going to be self-employed or if you're a photographer which my wife is, comes out and goes, what do you mean there's no job in photography? How do you write a resume for this if you're not self-employed? And if I am self-employed, how do you do the accounting? And so I have a big philosophy on integration. And our firm was built on the science and art and integrating, and that's why we did the merger. So the one person that, and oddly enough isn't here, unfortunately, is uh, my gold. When he first came to town, we sat with him, and he was looking for a career change from the, the abroad and his agency experience in the Heineken's and his amazing realm of experience. And uh, he also sat and said, I'd like to teach at the university. What do you know and who do you know? And in fact, that's how he met the people to get the job here in the beginning, which is kind of funny. Uh, and he also, I said, if you get up there, here's the thing you need to do for me. If you teach the promotions class that does the advertising competition, bring in graphic design students into the competition as well as marketing and management students into the competition and try to create a better cross-fertilization between the programs, which Mike did. 
So I know that one opportunity on campus has been exceptionally upgraded and a lot more attractive. What we're working on the Italy side is trying to get School of Art students to travel with College of Business students and work on small and medium-sized business enterprise projects here in the sense of market study and strategic planning and graphic design and go there and work with the actual companies on product development, design, strategy, culture, and work as a team in both sides of the continent and put those people on the same campus in essence, you know, 10 and 10 art students, uh, College of Business marketing students. Uh, for me, I think that that is probably one of the more exceptional resume builders, but I'm hoping Mike and them have done more than that. That's the extent I know so far. I also know there's a big, uh, in that Italy side, there's a big, uh, uh, this College of Business along with the New York University, I think it was New York University, uh, have put in for a grant. There's a special grant to help fund a project in Italy and a couple of places, Italy and Greece, along with MSU and New York, to put students over there. So hopefully they'll cross-pollinate with some of the campus folks. That's what I know. Right. We'll turn the mic over. We it. I'm going to introduce uh, Diane Donnelly. She is going to tell you a little bit about, about the Academic Advising Center. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Crawford is able uh, to join us, so we will turn it directly over to Diane. Thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Donnelly from University Studies in the Academic Advising Center. And um, over the years, our department has change somewhat, I think, to meet the needs of students. When we do a lot of interdisciplinary advising, we are all about the adding value. So if you are marketing majors in business and you're wondering, well, what might be a good minor to add to that? What might be some specific courses that could add value? Like there's a new web design class that's team taught by computer science and graphic design. Um, you might not even know that exists, but boy, maybe that's something you'd like to take. These are the kind of things that, that we can help you with. We provide about 25 to 30% of all of our advising in our offices for students in specific majors. It's not for, uh, our primary focus has been on entering students who are exploring, not sure exactly what major they want to go into, trying to find their fit. But now we do a much more campus-wide, and we worked for years with career services and um, I just got to say exactly, to back up exactly what you both said, it is all about the internship, it's all about the experiences you have while you're in college, your summer jobs, what you do. In my office of academic advising, um, I think in the 15 years I've worked there, there's only one person that was hired from an advertised <coughs> position, it's all through connections, and that person, one reason we really looked at her application is because she had gone to graduate school with one of our other staff, you know? I mean, it's all those kind of connections. I did my internship, and then I moved up, and now I'm the associate director of the program. I mean, that's how it works. Um, and so I strongly encourage you to do that. Um, another thing I would say in terms of, because I work, I do advising for liberal studies students, which you know, the thing is, well, what are you going to do with that kind of a major? Well, you're going to do what you guys have said. You said you don't care, particularly what the major is. You're looking for a certain kind of an individual with specific knowledge, experiences, and maybe you can help train them. And so there is real, there's ability to do that. But what I tell students is, okay, where do you want to work? And so I've been thinking with marketing, what's the realm you want to work in? Do you want to work in higher ed? I mean, we have marketing people here. We have accountants here. We have human resource people here. Um, do you want to work in the healthcare environment? Do you want to work in the entertain entertainment business? Do you want to work for corporate America? Do you want to work, you know, for the ski industry? Ski areas have accountants and marketing people, et cetera, et cetera. So if that's a way to start thinking about where you want to go through marketing degree, I think that can be, you know, kind of helpful too. Because that might be some of the things that you know where you, you would enjoy being. Um, so I've got some cards back here that talk about where we're at. You know, we're in Reed Hall too. We're just down the 418. And um, so if you have any questions about minors or other things that you might have to do, be an advocate on campus, be an orientation leader, all kinds of tremendous opportunities, come see us and we're um, happy to get. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sam. Okay, 
so we have some numbers for you. I want to share with you some data that we've, we've received um, from our past graduates. So if you're getting ready to graduate now, uh, please answer the phone call from Career and Internship Services when you get it. Uh, we want to know where you're going when you finish the school uh, because this information uh, is information that's available to you. Uh, we hear from graduates. We want to pass it on. So please help us to collect that because it's important data. Uh, we had a 62% response rate for 2007. Uh, we just are just about to wrap up 2008 and just launched 2009, so we're constantly collecting these numbers. 86% um, of respondents reported being in school, or excuse me, employed full time or in graduate school full time. We do include graduate school uh, as part of full time employment simply because some professions, with profession based uh, uh, degrees, require a master's degree for licensure. Uh, so architecture is a great example of that. So we want to point that out. 7.6% are employed or graduate school part-time. 2.7% are unemployed and they're still looking. And then there's almost 2% that are out there that aren't looking. So they are enjoying life, um, not working, which I'm jealous. No, <laughs> we call them, they have money. We don't know. We, we, we'd like to know what they're up to. But average salary in year by degree, uh, we have, Three years right here we're showing you, um, and you can see that they will, uh, the salaries grow. Uh, and there's been an increase over the last three years. Uh, but you'll also notice that as your degree attainment increases, you can expect your salary to increase. Uh, that's nationally, uh, that's what you'll see, but this is what we're seeing here at MSU as well. The N over there is the number of people that responded to the specific salary data. Specific to business marketing, <laughs> this is what the numbers look like. Again, the last three years. Average salary in state versus out of state. So <coughs> you can see here that uh, students who are working outside the state of Montana tend to make a little bit more. We do like to point out as well uh, that if you choose to live out st out of state, with, with the exception of a couple areas in the state of Montana, the cost of living is higher if you work out of state. So just something to note when you're looking at these comparisons. <coughs> These are the areas by uh, business marketing. Again, you can see, I'll go back just really quickly. Again, it's okay, it's again, okay. you can see, um, for the most part, there's um, there's some increase in salaries as well. It depends on how many students we wear back from as well, but you can kind of see that trend happening there too. Where are students going? So we saw the in-state versus out-of-state data. Students in the College of Business, 67% of them are actually staying inside the state of Montana. So there's that myth out there that you have to leave Montana to get a good paying job or to get a job that you're in, you know, that will work for you. And we're not seeing that. And in fact, as a college, overall, 62% uh, of in, uh, respondents remain in state. Uh, so if you do want to stay in Montana, if you're from here or you moved here for school and love it, um, you can stay if you want to.